Dear students, dear colleagues, dear guests, a very, very, very warm welcome also from my side uh, to the second day of our Effective Transformation Conference. I have the honor to introduce Andrew Ross. He's a broadly trained scholar of international relations, international law and political theory. He holds a PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins University and is actually an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Ohio State University. I got to know him thanks to his book published in 2014, Mixed Emotions Beyond Fear and Hatred in International Conflict. It is because of this publication that I asked Marie-Louise Angerer to invite him to this conference. He, of course, published other articles on effective politics, questions of realism and emotions. Let's see what he's going to tell us today. Dear Andrew, thank you for coming all the way from the US. We are looking forward to listening to your talk. The floor is all yours. Okay. Thank you very much. I saw Berndt do this yesterday, and I, I just, I've been waiting for 12 hours to be able to be in control of this. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, and, and thank you to Michaela and Berndt and Mary Louisa for the invitation. It's, it's a great honor to be here, and uh, to, especially at this particular juncture for me, as I move into a new project on digital media, as really an outsider to the field. And, and uh, for that reason, I, I look forward to comments and suggestions uh, from the audience that I, I hope and, and trust will help me move this project forward. Um, I've titled the talk, The Cultural Politics of Digital Humanitarianism, simplified a little bit from what's in the program. Um, and by digital humanitarianism, I'm referring variously to hashtag campaigns, video advocacy, crisis mapping, and video gaming, all of which are efforts to leverage user-driven digital technologies to advance humanitarian politics. And in particular, I'm interested in tracing the affective byproducts of, digital, uh, of these digital activities and outlining the new configurations of authority and power that they're beginning to, uh, to create. And so this is part of a larger project on digital media in global politics. And, and my overall objectives are, are to really take a step back from any one empirical area and, and look at how digital practices are reconfiguring human capabilities for action and expression and sensation. Uh, and secondly, assessing how these reconfigurations of human agency are creating different kinds of opportunities for cultural authority and the application of, of power. Today I'm also interested in the prior task of deconstructing a little bit the liberal discourse on, uh, uh, on humanitarianism and on the role of communications technologies in the advancement of humanitarian objectives. And in particular, I'm, I'm intrigued by the persistence with which liberal commentary and analysis attributes a global or planetary dimension to digital networks. These assertions reflect a particular teleology that regards successive developments in communications technology um, as enlarging or expanding human sensory capabilities and moral awareness. And so I'll suggest that this teleology is expressed in uh, the recent speech by then U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, um, who offered this McLuhan-esque uh, reference that, uh, to the effect that digital networks were creating a new nervous, a new planetary nervous system. And so I'm interested in sort of moving back and forth between this liberal discourse uh, and the expectations that it creates for thinking about the scale on which these digital technologies are uh, impacting moral awareness and political 
um, engagement, and, and then also uh, mapping out in a preliminary fashion some of the, uh, some of the effects that I think, uh, though some of the more complex effects that I think digital practices may be having in the field of humanitarianism. So <clears throat> just map out briefly, uh, excuse me, Um, sort of the agenda, as it were, uh, for my talk. I want to start just with some context on where I'm coming from and how I theorize emotion and affect. And uh, secondarily, offer a, a brief reflection on this liberal discourse of humanitarianism and global connectivity. And then third, develop some preliminary ideas, and this is where I'll be fishing for suggestions and, and, and input. Um, some preliminary ideas about the more complex, and I'll suggest non-global, affective products emerging from digital humanitarianism. <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure how long uh, this will take. I hope it's within the allotted time. I think I'll probably fall short rather than go too long. But I've said that before and uh, been proven very wrong. So. Um, so a little bit of context. Um, my, my previous work and the book to which, um, to which Michaela alludes set out to understand the social and political dimensions of emotion and affect in international politics. And I was interested in a variety of different emotionally charged phenomena. I talked about terrorism and counterterrorism nationalism and ethnic conflict and various uh, efforts to remedy, uh, to remedy uh, um, violent conflict um, through eliciting uh, emotional responses. For me, I, it was interesting to listen to Berndt's, um, I don't know where Berndt is, uh, to listen to his introduction yesterday. Um, I think he introduced or maybe alluded to me then maybe as a representative of political science, which always makes me uncomfortable. Uh, it's not really a perfect disciplinary home for me. Um, but uh, he, he alluded to the, the kind of lost innocence in the affective turn. And I think the way the affective turn has been appropriated and, and taken up in the study of politics within the social sciences may not have ever, um, you know, accepted that innocence. And so for, for me, affect is as much a part of liberatory uh, projects as it is a part of um, various forms of extremism and, uh, and exclusionary uh, politics. Um, and <clears throat> So, so let me say a little bit about how I conceptualize affect with a, with a particular um, you know, eye to setting up some of the comments in the later part of the talk. I treat emotions as um, products of social practice. Um, the emotions we experience are a function of uh, essentially what the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, political speeches, protest activities, memorialization rituals, media broadcasts. These are political events reflecting certainly objectives and interests uh, on the part of, of those who orchestrate them. But they're also social interactions uh, involving embodied participation uh, and, and certain affective investments. And so as people interact together in a variety of these uh, social uh, social practices, they become entrained into certain patterns of affective response. And in turn, these practices are opportunities for the expression, uh, public expression of, uh, of those emotional responses. And when we receive expressions of emotion from others, our brains are wired to simulate those affective responses. And these processes of mirroring uh, are part of the way we experience and produce uh, emotional responses ourselves. And so I talk about the way in which uh, contagion becomes a pathway for uh, the social genesis of affective response. So what does all this mean for studying affective politics? In my account, as emotions are produced through social, shared social practice, 
And as the work of contagion uh, proceeds, opportunities abound for expressions in one social field, affective expressions in one uh, area of social life to ripple out uh, into others. And so as investigators, we tend to compartmentalize our analytical uh, concerns and domains into politics over here and culture over there and economics there. We compartmentalize various analytical variables, uh, you know, race and gender and so forth. Um, but in, in everyday life, human beings are embedded within multiple intersecting social worlds and the affective experience uh, they, uh, they encounter is, uh, is, is complex as a result. And so the emotions we feel uh, that are produced within one set of social practices is continually being played out and expressed across a variety of, uh, of other social fields. And so I talk a lot about the ways in which emotions produced in relation to one set of social practices can spill over into and impact um, seemingly unrelated, uh, unrelated um, political phenomena. And I think, you know, I don't talk about this in relation to domestic politics, but I see this playing out in a variety of areas. Um, and, uh, and I think some of the, you know, the current concerns about populism and the mobilization of, uh, of xenophobic sentiments um, can, can be understood through this process of contagious um, spillover. Where, uh, where economic grievances and, and, and uh, economic and uh, social frustrations are, are engendering a certain form of exclusionary politics. And so the cultural politics of emotion necessitates a strange kind of analysis that begins from affective circulations uh, and then looks for unexpected spillover effects that involve uh, emotional responses um, from one social field infiltrating another um, with possible implications for the way collective agency is constituted and for the way cultural authority um, is located. And so today I want to suggest that some of the emotions that have built up around uh, digital uh, humanitarianism are, um, are may serve a, a variety of political projects, including some that don't align uh, particularly well with, uh, with all humanitarian sensibilities. So that's where a little bit about where I've come from. And, and the previous work talked a little bit about uh, media, especially broadcast media, that helped to sustain emotional expression uh, in non-local contexts, but really it was a project written for a pre-digital uh, age, and uh, and some of the developments that uh, that are the subject of uh, of this conference were uh, you know were very much not on my radar, um, and. I'm trying to change that, and uh, and this new project is an effort to uh, to take stock of what impact digital media are having on the landscape of of emotion generating social practices, and my wager is that social interactions are configured differently in the context of digital media whose content is continually co-produced by uh, by, by users at the level of the user. And, uh, and I, I suspect that the characteristics of these uh, mediating vehicles uh, help to shape not only what kind of affective circulations they sustain, but also how those affective circulations aggregate in ways that have cultural and political impact. So let me say, uh, something a little bit about this new field of digital humanitarianism and I guess initially uh, some reflections on this uh, broader cultural discourse around global connectivity and the 
uh, and the unifying potential for digital networks. I'm interested in, as I said initially, a variety of different uh, digital media practices that are being employed in the field of humanitarianism. Um, from crisis mapping tools to serious video games to video advocacy and hashtag uh, campaigns. And it seems clear that these digital tools represent new tactical and strategic opportunities for humanitarian organizations and advocates. And human rights advocacy has always been uh, what some have referred to as a visibility project. It's, it, it's uh, predicated on the task of rendering visible human suffering and acts of, uh, of uh, human rights violation that might otherwise go unseen. And digital technologies are creating new and different vehicles for establishing this visibility. Um, but I'm going to suggest that the, the devil is in the details and that we don't yet know how digital practices in the field of humanitarianism might be aggregating into broader uh, system level effects uh, on cultural authority and political power in the present. One perspective or one narrative about the role of digital media emphasizes its uh, cosmopolitan potential. Um, and uh, continues to uh, inflect contemporary assessments of digital networking and the promise of global connectivity more generally. The liberal story emphasizes the potential for those digital networks to connect users across cultural and geographic boundaries. In the course of these normative claims, the liberal vision insists on associating di digital technologies with a global scale. And this scalar attribution is part of what interests me here. And so let me just use one example that uh, alludes to this, uh, this internet freedom speech given by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2010. The speech contains a variety of, um, you know, uh, familiar, not particularly surprising uh, comments and reflections on the importance of information networks to promoting democratic values, uh, to promoting uh, international development, and uh, extending uh, the uh, American led uh, project of counterterrorism. None of that was particularly surprising. Um, but it also boasted the great humanitarian potential afforded by social media networks. And Clinton noted the massive efforts that had occurred in raising money uh, for the earthquake, uh, victims of the earthquake in Haiti, which had occurred uh, just a week or so prior to the speech. And so she noted that the text Haiti campaign, uh, where users were asked by the International Red Cross and other uh, institutions to uh, to text the word Haiti and that this would, um, this would automatically trigger a donation. Um, she noted that this uh, campaign had already raised a very impressive sum of money um, and she described it as, quote, a showcase for the generosity of the American people. And you can see here, I, I think I outed myself yesterday as a, as a, as a Canadian uh, with, with uh, uh, reservations about American uh, political culture, and so this, you know, I, I'm, I'm always ruminating on uh, maybe the, the disjuncture between uh, uh, my own uh, sensibilities and, and some of what I see in the American uh, political scene. Um, so you'll bear with me. I mean, I think we had a little bit of uh, group therapy last night in reference to the Trump uh, phenomenon. It's, it's, very, uh, it's very therapeutic for us. Uh, it's been a hard year uh, in the United States. So um, although some of the dynamics that interest me actually, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they certainly predate the Trump era and I think they have long uh, roots in the, uh, in the uh, American uh, uh, conceptualization of liberal internationalism. Um, and so Cl Clinton 
leverages this Haiti example uh, to proclaim the importance of internet technologies for global collaboration, especially in pursuit of democratic politics and, or democratic values. And the speech blended uh, resistance to censorship and state limits on internet access with a kind of celebratory gloss on the potential for digital communications to retool humanity uh, for ethics and politics, all on what she described as a very impressively global scale. And so, and so she makes this statement that information networks, she argued, um, and this is the formulation that interests me, uh, were forming a new nervous system for the planet. So what is this idea of a planetary nervous system? Uh, what does it mean? What, uh, what assumptions underlie it? And how does it condition our thinking about digital technologies in the field of humanitarianism? Certainly the reference was part of a strategy of political rhetoric and perhaps the planetary nervous system component was merely understood as a metaphor by Clinton's speechwriters, we can't know. Um, but I think to a media studies audience, it taps into a deeper history of associations between mediated communications and globally extended sensory and affective capabilities. Um, and so I think that uh, the, the, uh, the, the reference harkens back to McLuhan's statement in Understanding Media, where he talks about the so-called electric age uh, creating a variety of, of sensory uh, adaptations, and he proclaims that our central nervous system is technologically extended to involve us in the whole of mankind. And in later works, he talks about the global village and inflects that with this very holistic uh, conceptualization of, uh, he talks about a resonating whole and this kind of impetus toward totality and inclusiveness. And so I think in that respect, Clinton's metaphor um, is, uh, is one that has deeper roots. And this idea that communications technologies bring about awareness and inclusiveness on a global scale is a powerful trope in the history of communications. Um, successive communications technologies, whether it's uh, print culture, the rise of the telegraph, radio, and so forth, are, are seen and have long been seen as expanding human sensory capabilities and providing a basis for consensus. And so in the mid-19th century, uh, you have figures like David Livingstone um, traveling internationally and recognizing the capacity for transportation and communications technologies uh, to, as he says, break down nationalities and bring people geographically remote into close connection. And these ideas are being taken up widely in the late 19th and early 20th century by figures uh, as diverse as uh, Michel Chevalier, Leonard Wolf, Norman Angel, all interested in the way in which communications technologies are facilitating uh, peaceful interaction and understanding across geographic and cultural boundaries. And I'm going to suggest that these, some of these assumptions and, and the ethos behind them is alive and well uh, into the 21st century in, uh, in some uh, contemporary arguments on global connectivity, on internet freedom, and on uh, the use of digital tools within the field of humanitarianism. The founding document, for example, of the, uh, of the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, declares a sacred duty to support the wide diffusion of culture and the education of humanity. And these ideas find expression in, uh, in some of the organization's statements on the subject of internet freedom and global connectivity more generally. Um, that, uh, this recent report talks about uh, the internet as a major medium uh, for fostering global communication. And so this 
liberal optimism around the global liberatory potential of digital technologies is informing the deployment of digital tools in the field of humanitarianism. And, uh, and, and I think actors in, in this area are embracing digital technologies for many good reasons, uh, regarding them as, as affording ever faster and larger scale opportunities for the witnessing work that is so central to human rights advocacy and humanitarian um, uh, mobilization. And so I want to talk just briefly about one, uh, one instance of this, uh, of this human internal humanitarian uh, discourse on digital media and its, its, uh, its potential. And this comes from a, uh, a, uh, a phenomenon in American human rights advocacy uh, that centered on this campaign to arrest the Ugandan leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, Joseph Kony, and I suspect this didn't get uh, quite as much uptake in Europe, um, but this was, big, this was a big deal in, in, uh, in the United States and especially on American college campuses and high schools um, where, and I can attest from my own teaching in human rights, that American students um, were very engaged by this kind of campaign. Um, the organization was sort of became notorious, sorry, this uh, was a, a, a campaign initiated by this San Diego-based organization, Invisible Children. And the, the group uh, produced this 30-minute short film uh, calling for intervention to apprehend Joseph Kony, who was accused of, uh, of employing and enslaving child soldiers. And the, the film raised a lot of controversy for its perceived disengagement from the complexity of the conflict in Uganda and from the phenomenon of, uh, of child soldiers and, and so forth. And I, I, I'm compelled by those critiques, but I'm, I'm setting them aside to sort of try to get inside the, the, the self-understanding and, the, and the, the narrative that the organization offered. Um, which is very explicit in this 30-minute short film. Um, and so the narrator in the film points out that, uh, you know, he, he offers a, a bold and, and confident defense of uh, digital networking and its ethical benefits. Um, he points out that right now, he says, quote, right now there are more people on Facebook than there were on the planet 200 years ago and explains that this platform allows for unprecedented visibility and solidarity across geographic boundaries. He says, humanity's greatest desire is to belong and connect, and now we have this opportunity uh, to see each other. And so through Facebook and other networks, he says, quote, we share what we love and it reminds us of what we all have in common. Another quote, the technology that has brought our planet together, he argues, is allowing us to respond to the problems of our friends. And so the language there of friends and liking that we're familiar with from Facebook and other social media platforms is very overtly uh, taken up and very literally incorporated into uh, this, this narrative of global connectivity and, uh, and democratic potential. Um, and so in, in that narrative, social media are, is, uh, uh, are understood as sustaining connection and friendship and unity uh, on a planetary scale. And the assumption behind this work is that digital technologies and practices with the potential for global accessibility are promoting empathy and consensus uh, on a similarly global scale. And this is what uh, you know, what uh, interests me and, and, and where I'm less convinced. And so it's as if the functional properties of digital communication, their ability to circulate on a global scale, dictates the ideas, beliefs, and shared sentiments, uh, that, the, that those ideas, beliefs, and shared sentiments also 
uh, occur and circulate on a similarly global scale. And so I'm going to suggest that this may not be the case and that digital media practices may be giving rise to a more uneven landscape uh, of affective responses and sensibilities, uh, sorry, sensitivities. I'll just show you one more graphic here from the 30 minute uh, Coney film. There's a lot of imagery that you know, renders visual this idea that individuals are being connected on a planetary scale and united uh, in pursuit of these shared uh, human objectives. And so this, I th I, as I recall, this one starts, each one of these sort of little pixelated uh, squares, you know, begins as a picture of one person and then it sort of, it pans out to see this, uh, this planetary um, effect. So let me say a little bit about digital humanitarianism um, and then try to tie these two threads, the discourse, the, the, the discourse that I've just mapped out and, and, and these emerging uh, practices in digital humanitarianism. Um, I'll just note at the outset that there's now a, a growing body of research, uh, of critical research on the phenomenon of humanitarianism. Um, that's painting a more complex story about the kind of work that human rights organizations and humanitarian actors are doing. Um, this is playing out across a variety of disciplines um, and, and, and various uh, scholars are, are taking stock of what issues are being addressed by uh, humanitarian uh, actors and, and with what effect and, and which issues are not being addressed uh, and, and to what effect. And, in relation to media and the cultural um, aspects of humanitarian work, this literature is, is often accusing humanitarianism of, of forms of sensationalism uh, built around celebrity endorsements and around video campaigns that are seen as crossing over the line between advocacy and entertainment. Um, and so I'm kind of arriving late to this field, but I think that or late to the party, I guess, as it were. Uh, but I think that um, further insights might be gained from revisiting the role of affect in the work of digital humanitarianism. There are, are footholds in the field uh, that can help to, uh, to stage this uh, analysis. One work that stands out for me is by Lily Huliaraki, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, who argues that celebrity activism, mediatization, and the merging of humanitarian politics with entertainment uh, have created what she describes as a post-humanitarian era. In her account, this post-humanitarian uh, condition is also a post-emotional one, uh, since it's more focused on personal uh, personal uh, fulfillment than on authentic care for the other. And yet it's telling that in Huliaraki's descriptions of this post-humanitarian era, um, she herself highlights seemingly emotional or affective responses such as enjoyment, um, shock, irony, and so forth. And indeed, she ultimately concedes that the de what she calls initially the de-emotionalization of our relations with distant others is being accompanied by an over-emotionalization of our safe everyday life. And so uh, what emerges from her analysis, I think, is not so much that, humani that it, uh, this post-humanitarian era is a non-emotional one, uh, than the idea that this new era of humanitarianism is populated with different kinds of affective dynamics. And my contention is that these need to be understood on their own terms, uh, not according to a quality that they lack, uh, some authentic form of empathy or, or solidarity, but on their own terms. What then can we say about affective, about the affective politics of digitally mediated humanitarianism? And so in this regard, I'm interested in understanding what's happening affectively uh, when 
the attention of large numbers of distributed users is being captured by images and expressions of human suffering uh, and efforts to respond to it. So I actually didn't have a slideshow prepared, but Baron, when he asked me to distribute my slideshow, I thought I'd better have one. So these were just some images that, uh, that I pinched from uh, other lectures I've given. Um, you know, some, some, uh, some, you know, I think uh, recognizable um, and iconic images in the field of humanitarianism and human rights advocacy. Um, and, and in some cases, these images of suffering bodies have uh, not only attracted our attention, but have fueled frenzies of digital media, uh, uh, relate, digital media, digitally mediated affective expression. Um, and so the, the image in the middle, the so-called uh, girl with a green shawl, was an image that Amnesty International employed in its uh, campaigns in the early 2000s. And these fed, perhaps inadvertently, into a very specific political discourse on American intervention in Afghanistan and the, um, and the need to liberate women uh, from the Taliban, all of which had very specific political uh, manifestations and, and, and consequences. Um, the image in the top left uh, is, I think, probably recognizable to all of us and still, you know, uh, I, I will concede, you know, really, as a, as a parent, uh, really breaks my heart every time, um, is this body, is this uh, image of a Syrian uh, uh, boy from Aleppo who's being evacuated um, from the destruction there. I didn't put the image here of the uh, Syrian boy, uh, Ilan Kurdi, who was uh, found uh, dead on the beach, the, Turkey, uh, the Turkish beach in 2015. Um, the image on the right is from this uh, Bring Back Our Girls campaign that I want to mention in a minute um, of the so-called Chibok girls in northeastern Nigeria that became the subject of this uh, hashtag campaign. Um, and so these kinds of images uh, are, are circulating digitally and, and by directing the attention of digital uh, users and digital co-producers, uh, all of us who curate our social media feeds and who uh, who reproduce uh, circ the digitally circulating content, these images serve as catalysts for a certain kind of digital labor um, uh, associated with humanitarianism. And this digital labor can be very fulfilling and even pleasurable. And as I said earlier, I can attest to, uh, to the way this is, you know, my ethnographic data uh, set, you know, consists of the students who've populated my human rights class for uh, a little over a decade. And, uh, and they're very invested in, uh, and sometimes very intense, uh, about their commitment to, uh, to some of these uh, digitally mediated humanitarian campaigns. And that's not a surprising or, or inherently, you know, negative or pathological phenomenon. Uh, acting for humanitarian ends uh, pays emotional dividends, um, and uh, you know, uh, generosity you know has effects on both the object of generosity and the uh, the actor who is uh, is uh, giving uh, the gift or or uh, engaged in initiating the generous uh, gesture. And this doesn't mean that those engaged in it are somehow merely seeking uh, pleasure or somehow caught in, in some form of narcissism. Um, people like participating in acts that they regard as generous. And, uh, and, and the, there's a philosopher of emotion, Jesse Prince, who says um, you know, that it feels good to do good. Um, and so my interest is not in pathologizing uh, the affective an expressive element of digital humanitarianism, but in, instead in assessing what cultural and political effects those, uh, ex, those expressive uh, uh, acts and, and, and practices may be having. This, the, 
and so the, the emerging uh, so-called experience economy uh, sustained through digital media is in this way predicated on the microscopic contributions of distributed users whose digital labor draws them into certain patterns of affective response. These practices perform a specific kind of social labor that both contributes to digital communication and networking and sustains particular regimes of, of cultural authority and power. So what are some of these regimes of cultural authority and power? You have to wait for it. Um, I'm going to suggest that these digital humanitarian practices are not politically neutral interventions in the name of saving strangers. There are specific kinds of, of interventions that favor certain political remedies uh, over others and that empower certain kinds of institutions uh, and certain kinds of helpers. For example, uh, I think I have a slide on this. Um, sorry, this, this was a slide I, I guess uh, should have been uh, about two minutes ago uh, that, that shows uh, some of the social media activity and in, in the top left some of the uh, serious video gaming that's built up around those iconic um, uh, images of uh, human suffering. Um, so examples of uh, digital humanitarian practices as endorse, as uh, enabling a very specific set of uh, institutional and political remedies in the field of humanitarianism. Um, video documentation through mobile phones is being used as the basic for f gathering forensic evidence in connection with the broader project of international criminal justice. And so organizations like Witness are educating users uh, in the field to, uh, to participate in this crowdsourced video data gathering. Um, crowdsourced uh, digital mapping, uh, the crisis mapping uh, that's uh, now being used across a variety of different uh, cases and conflicts are helping to raise awareness and to direct humanitarian assistance and performing a variety of very important functions. But they're also helping uh, to extend forms of surveillance uh, in which victims, th that affect uh, victims negatively even as they aim to alleviate suffering. And then the Coney 2012 campaign essentially married the enjoyment and care of largely American supporters with some very specific political and legal remedies. And so the organization was, and the sort of punchline of the film was really about supporting American military intervention to back up uh, international criminal justice efforts to arrest um, this war criminal. Um, and so, Viewed individually, these acts of digital labor are about and oriented toward distinct humanitarian objectives. But viewed in the aggregate, they're implicated in uh, broader changes in the location of cultural authority, uh, the kinds of uh, political remedies that are understood to be appropriate and effective in uh, these humanitarian uh, crises and human rights abuses. Um, and as such, I'm going to suggest they're implicated in changing relations of power. So put differently, digital practices become the instrument of production capable of translating these micro tasks into larger uh, social processes and perhaps structures. These are the emergent effects of co-production in digital environments. Because users select into specific types of digital humanitarian labor, and because those digital activities vary from one campaign to another, from one issue area to another, uh, from, one, uh, from one cluster of users uh, to another, the pleasure and other affective responses produced therein are likely to be non-global in scale. Uh, these are often uh, much more uneven 
and, uh, and uh, sometimes quite localized in ways that the larger discourse of unity and global connectivity uh, don't, uh, don't, you know, uh, don't predict. These affective responses uh, may be quite intense, uh, as with the sense of urgency conveyed by the Coney film, and yet they can take hold among very specific uh, groups and constellations of distributed but digitally connected supporters. Because the digital labor that generates shared affective experience is distributed in this uneven fashion across populations of, of digital users, there's no necessary uniformity to the production of affective response via digital media. And so the result is a, a very differentiated field of affective experience that, that doesn't align with this broader uh, narrative uh, that attributes globality uh, to, uh, to digital media. Um, one thing before I wrap up here, just to connect this back to some of my earlier work on affect, I think part of what's going on in this field of humanitarianism is that these, uh, the emotions and affective responses generated through uh, these digital campaigns are having effects across a variety of, of, uh, of social fields that, uh, that are often uh, separate from uh, those in which they're originally uh, elicited. And so, you know, we're used to assessing these kinds of efforts and campaigns according to the, uh, the intentions behind them and according to whether or not you know, they, they uh, achieve their intended uh, legal and political goals in this case. But the affective byproducts of social practices are manifold and these are not always confined to the field in which they're originally or initially elicited. And so I draw from the work of Sarah Ahmed, who talks about the sideways movement of affect, um, that affect in, in this way is a creative force uh, that allows human actors to move continually across multiple social fields. And that this, the, the political, Bernd talked yesterday about the political ambivalence associated with affect. And I think that the political ambivalence of affect is tied to this kind of migratory potential that affect can, br can be elicited in one domain or in relation to one set of emotionally uh, um, eliciting, uh, emotionally um, uh, productive uh, images and, and practices, uh, but then feed into a variety of, uh, of uh, political projects and uh, institutional um, initiatives uh, that may or may not conform to the intentions behind their original, uh, you know, the actors who uh, are initially engaged in them. So let me uh, bring this to a conclusion and try to wrap these two threads together a little bit. Uh, I think that these, what I'm describing as these emergent effects of digitally mediated humanitarianism are invisible to us if our analytical focus is trained on digital media as just one more chapter in the long history of expanding communications. And that assumption is, is just what that liberal discourse on global connectivity in, entices us to do. Digital practice is both about communication and about embodied participation in affectively expressive practices. Users are sending messages and, and transmitting data, but the aggregated social effects of these activities lies both in circulation, in, sorry, communication and in the circulation of affect. We also don't see these new forms of cultural authority and relations of power if we're focused on the promise of outcomes associated with unity, consensus, and inclusiveness, the affective politics associated with digital humanitarianism, I'm suggesting, is distinctly non-global in that its political impact is highly differentiated according to who's doing what with digital media tools um, and, and how, uh, how 
different users are, are affected by the practices they're engaged in. And so it's true that digital media are inherently transnational and have this uh, functional potential to reach globally distant users, but this potential for global reach doesn't dictate the form or the scale of the shared affective experiences they engender in practice. So I'm gonna leave it there and uh, look forward to questions you might have and hopefully uh, suggestions as well. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one. I mean, um, I, I agree that the involvement of individual humanitarian actors is, you know, is continually informed by, you know, the social environment and the context in which they're, uh, they're seeking to make a, a contribution. Um, and so I don't, I mean, I, I guess I don't see a, a, a sort of individual level per se. I think, as you say, the individual, uh, the uh, digital practices are, uh, are continually um, creating uh, effects on uh, a, an aggregate level that, uh, that inform the involvement of uh, seemingly individual users. So um, I don't feel like that fully answers your question. Uh, it's just a little question if the effective practices nowadays do not force us to conceive of other types of agents, you know, nor individual, nor collective ones. And if you do not have to find new terms concerning that. But mm -hmm. we'll tell you what to say. Uh, yeah, thanks. My question actually is very much related uh, to Michaela's. And so, well, question maybe slash suggestion. You know, I'm interested the way you frame the problem between individual and, let's say, global agency or affect is in terms of a kind of dichotomy or discontinuity between them. You've got individual agency, you've got global agency. And I think, along with Michaela, I think the interesting place that one might want to think or talk about is what is what happens in the middle there and what are all of the various kinds of intermediaries that are involved in uh, individual in on the one hand scaling up as individual acts become more collective never reaching this kind of uh, liberal idea of 
of global or universe, globality or universality, and then also how they scale back down, how individual affects and individual agency is constructed technically. So it seems to me that the interesting place to look is um, in between in that chain of intermediaries. And I don't know if you've begun thinking about that or uh, if that's sort of where you might be wanting to head. I, th I mean, I think it is. So now I think I understand a little bit more clearly. Um, and I think maybe I've, you know, by talking about digital users, I think I'm, I'm individualizing, uh, you know, the, the human element within these technological practices in a way that, uh, that I'm not wanting to do. And I think it is in that in-between that, that, that interests me. Um, you know, I talk about, uh, you know, I think that, that the uh, effects of these uh, digital practices within humanitarianism uh, are, I, I say they're, they're resulting in a, 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 um, formations that are not global in scale. And I think by that, I don't mean that they're individual. I think that, that they're actually, uh, they're, they're multi-scalar. I mean, they're, and I think that actually part of what's happening is that conventional sort of, uh, you know, um, scalar hierarchies are being eroded. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, uh, that digital practices are enabling us to move across traditional uh, spatial boundaries um, and, and, and to do so in concert with other digitally distributed users in a way that already renders us more than individual but less than global. Um, so I, I think I am interested in that in between and I, I, uh, whether we call it community or collectivity or I don't, I think I, I hesitate in that regard because I think these formations are more fluid. Uh, and what interests me in part is, is taking stock of, you know, uh, political implications that result from these more fluid uh, social practices. And so to, to freeze it and say, you know, that there's a, a movement uh, and, and to define the parameters of, of say, that movement uh, is maybe close but is still, is still um, fixing it in a way that that uh, I don't want to do, but this the 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 scalar dimension and the and the emergence of sort of non-traditional practices uh, uh, of scale, you know, interests me very much. And I think at this point I'm just oh sorry, too much too much time uh, is uh, is uh, you know is is part of what draws me to this, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. I, I, I want to ask you if you could um, share some thoughts about um, the temporality of effect, um, because I had the idea during uh, your talk that maybe some problems that these digital humanitarian campaigns have, that they have such a sh short lifespan, and they are in the field of technology where the newness of technology gives the impression that everything has to be up to date all the time and has to renew itself and make a permanent revolution. And this is maybe a, a problem for something that wants to have a, a longer lifespan, some continuity, something really of a move, movement. And maybe this is also some meaning of affect in the sense that's not equal to emotion, but maybe has a specific temporal quality. This would be one question. And the other would be, um, if you could compare this kind of um, digital humanitarianism, humanitarianism to uh, established social institutions that do human, humanitarian work, um, I think you could see that they are, um, sometimes they interconnect, sure, but they, they also work on, on different levels and maybe the impact of these digital humanitarians is, is very, very, very much lower than everything that is institutionalized. So um, my idea would uh, be maybe you could compare it somehow to the notion of, of music and youth culture where you also have this combination of communication and effect that you cannot really measure what the impact is, but there is some kind of global musical network in youth culture that changes how people feel and think, even if it doesn't lead to action now, maybe in 20 years and something. Yeah. Sorry. 
Th thank you for that. I'll think about this more. Um, on the temporality, um, I've been trying to wrap my head actually around the sort of spatiality and reading work in you know cultural geography and to sort of inspire that side. But the temporality is is interesting as well. And and one of the things you know that strikes me in these digital uh, campaigns is the the way in which they are fueling a sense of urgency. Um, and uh, so I think about I don't think I maybe put this slide up there, but the campaign around conflict minerals. Oh, it is the top right there by this American uh, kind of uh, organization, the Enough Project. And the, the whole idea is, you know, we've had enough. There's this sort of idea that change m must happen now. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that's been a very powerful sort of trope within um, digital humanitarian mobilization. Um, and, uh, and, and, and yet, I don't think that that, uh, that element of urgency and the sometimes fleeting nature of these campaigns m means that their cultural impact or political consequences are, some t are somehow you know, merely episodic, that they, you know, that they have durable impact um, and cumulative impact, uh, even if each particular manifestation or each particular uh, campaign is quite short-lived, but I'm still I'm still sort of thinking about it. Yes, thank you very much. I couldn't help but ask myself about some kind of the dark side of digital humanitarianism, because there is a kind of post-human or, or post-humanitarian humanitarianism which is digitally induced, which is only possible in the digital age, I think. And this is called effective altruism. I don't know if you heard of it yet. Uh, effective altruism is a kind of completely detached from emotion and detached from affects. It's a kind of way of thinking about humanitarianism and helping um, in terms of statistics and in terms of the trolley problem, so to speak. So, uh, w w uh, so uh, how do we effectively help humanity? And to do this, we have to think in terms of decidability and accountability like digital media does. So there is a kind of post-human humanitarianism, I think, that is opposed to this kind of idea of the global nervous system, of this idea of amplification, amp uh, amplificating uh, effective communities through digital media. It's completely the other way around. It's a detachment from affect and emotion through digital media. What would be your opinion on that? Um, my opinion is that I'm intrigued to get, you know, some references from you because it's not something I've encountered. I mean, if there's a specific reference here to this idea of effective uh, Okay, um, but you know, the, I think uh, it's it sounds like you know it's a it's a, a, a phenomenon that speaks to the you know the the um, political ambivalence of data, right? That that data can be used in a variety of ways and and uh, and, and mapped and 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 uh, um, so. Uh, Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll look forward to sort of learning more about this. Um, I'm not sure I have an initial take on it, except that, uh, you know, I think that the, you know, one of the things that interests me in the study of affective politics more generally are, are the, um, you know, the, the discourses and narratives around the role of affectivity. And so if there is an internal sort of recognition here of, the uh, limits of uh, affective um, mobilization, you know, that interests me. I, you know, I, I am not, uh, you know, as, as I said, I tried to make clear about halfway through that, you know, my interest is not in pathologizing the affective dimension. It's in understanding the impact, you know, the, the cultural and political effects that it's having, not to expunge it from humanitarian practice. So I, I might have a slight sort of different 
orientation to it, but I, you know, I would be curious to understand the perspective. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, my question could just, you know, be uh, a little bit going further than uh, Marco's question, because I was thinking about your, the, the way you introduced the post-humanitarian era, when you talked about the effective response, uh, which could lead to a de-emotionalization after an over-emotionalization. And I guess, you know, this is exactly what Marcus means, you know, that it has nothing to do with an effective response, but it is a total a radical detachment. And I was thinking, you know, when you, inter or when you show these images from Abu Ghraib and the girls, and I mean, and there's a, there is an, a, a politics, which is a politics of mixed crossing, or a politics of mixing all the uh, various levels, because these are images. These are, I mean, of course, you know, they are distributed digitally, but they are images, and there is a politics of image. And a politics of image is not from, as a per se, an effective politics. Of course, it can be used. It can be, you know, uh, and, and the way, you know, these iconic images has made their travel along this, they have been used, you know, too. But there are images in the first sight. Uh, and my question, you know, is in which ways, you know, these tweet matches, messages, they are, not, they are not operating on the same level. So I think, you know, one has to differentiate these various levels of campaigning. It's something different if I just have to press a button to say yes or I'm against no. Because I'm not responding to these images, you know, these are not... Do you understand what I mean? I think so. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes me think a little bit of Richard's comment. I th think it was Richard last night about the embeddedness of mult of different uh, you know media formats, and and that you know tweets are getting commented on by cable news and newspaper articles about Facebook posts and and so forth. And uh, I'm not sure that I would want to. I I'm not sure I'm convinced that the the image. You know, the images have an originary sort of affective potential that the social media uptake of those images, you know, does not. I mean, I think it's, I could see that it's different and that the social media context allows for this, you know, participatory engagement and reappropriation of those images. And so that opens up a bunch of, you know, a series of questions about, uh, about co-production and the agency associated with co-production but um, yeah I'm not I'm not sure that there's f for me that that there's authenticity in the image in in some way if that maybe that's not what you're saying oh, okay uh, sorry I, I if I'm misunderstanding but I, I do I do think that the the you know, thinking about disaggregating these different elements. I mean, I think part of what your comment is, is suggesting I, 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 I do is, is sort of think about these various um, moments in the um, this sort of life cycle of a humanitarian campaign and that, you know, that there may be different functions performed or different effects that are uh, occurring, you know, within different areas of that. And I'm, you know, in this, at this stage, I'm just kind of lumping it all together. Yeah. Um, so, thank you for your interesting talk. I'd like to urge you maybe to go uh, furthermore into the urgency aspect that you mentioned already, so the dynamics of how effect is used uh, in humanitarian campaigns, um, because um, this is not a new tendency of uh, humanitarianism. Um, images in humanitarian uh, campaigns have always been selected according to affective criteria. most of all. Um, there should be suffering displayed uh, or there should be some beautiful person who is currently endangered. Um, this is um, information I have from friends who work in the area and they're really actually disgusted with the fact that they are forced to chase for images that um, uh, have this um, suffering display in them. 
Um, and I, I think this is sort of affected sort of the bait for the whole um, power that can be accumulated by a campaign. So uh, I think you're on a very right uh, and very important track with saying that urgency um, is a key point um, for, for humanitarian campaigns uh, and to also um, the show, like the sort of display of suffering. Um, so I don't know how that relates to uh, the coldly calculated um, sort of humanitarian f uh, f manner of work that uh, the colleagues uh, mentioned, but I'd, I'd think that um, you should see af effect as the catalyst of it. And it's also not, uh, maybe not so relevant to um, disassemble it into individual and uh, group because it's uh, always also institution driven. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that the the um, you know the the employment of visual images to depict human suffering in the field of humanitarianism is not a digital thing. I mean, this goes back to early human rights campaigns, um, and uh, you know I think the work of Elaine Scarry on the body and pain is a sort of foundational um, you know analysis of that dynamic. Um, and uh, it, I, I think that um, you know it's the digital uh, platforms are providing you know uh, the the opportunity to you know circulate these much more rapidly and then to to layer on top of the image itself this participatory uh, interaction for distributed users to reproduce that content and and repost and reappropriate in various ways and. Um, the urgency, I, uh, you know, I, th I think is is uh, p politically I find um, y you know troubling insofar as in some cases it's it's leading to this idea that sort of doing something suboptimal is always better than doing nothing, and I think you know m uh, my colleagues who study Nigerian politics you know are very disturbed by the way the Bring Back Our Girls campaign you know, played out on the ground in northeastern Nigeria, um, you know, playing into the hands of Boko Haram in very specific ways. You know, they, they had, uh, and so, and I think the same, you know, could be said of, of campaigns around um, the, the conflict in Darfur, you know, the commentators have sort of established, you know, that, th that these campaigns have, have not, have probably done more harm than they've done good. Um, and I think some of that is tied to this idea of urgency. And that, I think, plays into, in the American context especially, and I, I don't know about the European, plays into a very specific legislative context where, you know, there's, there's a very short um, uh, sort of life cycle for, uh, you know, um, attracting the attention of legislators and, and so forth. We will continue to talk anyway until tonight. Thank you very much.